You're listening to the Even Bigger Ideas podcast series, brought to you by State of Flux. Hi there, I'm Philip Eidson, host of the Procurious Even Bigger Ideas podcast, a five-part podcast series available exclusively to Big Ideas digital delegates. Sponsored by State of Flux, this series allows us to go that little bit deeper with five of the most intriguing power players at this year's Big Ideas Summit in London. In this episode, I sit down with Dr. Linda Yu, a renowned economist, broadcaster and adjunct professor of economics for London Business School. Linda and I discuss globalisation, the impact on world trade of protectionist policies and what procurement professionals can do to start preparing for a world rife with uncertainty. And I start by asking Linda if the potential impacts on global trade are being over-exaggerated or if she feels that we're actually standing at an inflection point that could have far-reaching consequences. I think we all hope it's the former, but (laughs) it might be the latter. And I think that's probably worth elaborating. So in many ways, it's hard to see how any one country could, say, turn back globalization. Because globalization means that um, it's not just that markets are open and more connected. It means that all of us are used to dealing... um, not just in trade, but also travel, getting our information, the internet. National borders have less meaning now than uh, for many than they have had uh, maybe compared with the past. So it's hard to see how um, anyone would stop and say, well, actually, I'm only going to access that to the internet if it starts in uh, my home country. Uh, That being said, I think that there is an increase in protectionist sentiment around the world and that could change the certainly the cost of doing global trade if I were to buy something from another country mm-hmm. maybe it'll be pricier because of um, tariffs or taxes that are being added to it and I suppose slightly more worrying is whether or not this is a blip so the pendulum might swing both ways at the moment there's a feeling that globalization hasn't benefited lower income, lower skilled yeah. people as much as those of higher income and higher skilled? Can this be rectified? Or are we starting a new phase where there could be um, more of a reluctance to allow globalization to proceed at the pace it has had over the past couple of decades? So I think that's why it's worth thinking about um, whether or not we really are just seeing the pendulum swing. And I think more importantly, it means We all have a responsibility to ensure that globalization and policies around trade are more equitable so it doesn't become an inflection point. So one of President Trump's first moves was to withdraw from TPP. And given that TPP was designed to strengthen the U.S.'s position in Asia, isn't that a little bit counterproductive? I think what the Trump administration and actually candidate Trump uh, made clear was that they view America first as the overriding economic principle. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership links America with Pacific Rim countries, and it was part of the previous administration's Asia pivot, which was to increase America's influence in Asia, and the TPP didn't include China. So it was a way of um, asserting um, America's a role, or reasserting America's role, because obviously America's always had a very big role um, in Asia as elsewhere. But withdrawing from ratifying TPP is consistent with President Trump's view that his main focus is going to be American jobs, American wages, uh, made in America. So I think the foreign policy aims are different than Obama's. But I suppose the big question is whether or not putting America first leads to uh, withdrawing of, say, international supply chains or an, an economic impact that may not actually be so good for America, given how multinational American companies are. But I think that's probably a different set of points of analysis. I think on the foreign policy side, I think withdrawing from TPP is consistent with uh, Trump's foreign policy, Mm -hmm. which is America first versus Obama's Asia pivot. 
and you talked a little bit about um, candidate Trump as well, and he regularly stated a desire to really get tough on trade with key trading partners like China. What's the reaction inside China been to his kind of rhetoric? Well, we've heard from the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, who spoke at the World Economic Forum in Davos. I've also heard from other Chinese policymakers at various meetings around the world that China has always been reluctant to take a strong leadership position in the global economy. Their main focus has always been on domestic development. But as America withdraws from a very critical space, China has indicated they may be willing to step in. So, for instance, with the U.S. pulling out of TPP, the Chinese are pushing for their regional free trade agreement, either RCEP or even potentially a new one called the Free Trade Area of the Asia-Pacific to take the place of TPP. So if there's a void, um, power will fill it. And I think that's essentially what we're seeing. But I would stress that the Chinese position is to support globalization because Mm -hmm. globalization has helped its economy. It's contributed to its remarkable growth. But they're reluctant leaders. They're not leaping into the space. So do you see um, or do you foresee a trade war being the result of kind of all this posturing and uh, vacuums being filled by other nations um, as a direct result of the policies of, of the Trump administration? Or is there really too much to lose for everybody concerned? I think there's too much to lose for all countries. I think pulling back from greater globalization doesn't necessarily mean there will be a trade war, however that might be defined. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is lots of businesses um, sell to consumers around the world. They produce in different countries because it gives them a supply chain advantage. And quite a lot of that happens despite political rhetoric. Where I think businesses have to be wary is whether or not the protectionist sentiment gets translated into additional customs checks, uh, higher tariffs on um, exports or imports, taxes on where a company locates its production. So the more likely outcome would be higher costs. And ultimately, that's also bad for consumers because um, this cost is likely to also Um, affect them. And also just practical things. If you have a great deal of supply chain disruption from uncertain economic policy or more protectionist measures, uh, you could end up with uh, goods and farm products being held at borders. And maybe holding a shipment of widgets isn't too damaging, but holding a shipment of tomatoes for days would be devastating. It's not talked about as much as tariffs or the single market or access for services companies. But I think, actually, if you uh, look at what a impact from Brexit will be, it will be more customs checks. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, the UK has free access to the European single market. You mentioned services. Do services fall under the the purview of of some of these trade agreements? I think services um, have the advantage of being fleet of foot because a lot of it is intangible, what's sold across borders. So unlike tomatoes that get stopped at the Channel Tunnel, um, services could be delivered uh, digitally, it could be done. So basically not in a way that um, borders would matter um, as much. However, that being said, services are not as liberalized either under the WTO Mm -hmm. or in the EU single market. It's probably not as, um, it's not not an issue of customs checks. The issue is more how open are services sectors going to be to British businesses in Europe after Brexit. Mm -hmm. And that is a big unknown. And it's a huge issue for British services, um, not just the companies, but also for the economy, because um, the services sector make up more than three quarters right. of British GDP. And Britain is the second biggest exporter of services in the world after only the United States. 
So looking across the world, um, lots of services markets are not that open, and yet British services have done pretty well. So I guess in one sense, they're used to it. Um, But that doesn't change the fact that there's going to be um, a lot of uncertainty about whether or not they should expect more disruption to their European businesses, which I expect they probably would have to anticipate. Because once Britain comes out of the European Union, there may be an implementation period about how long it takes to fully extricate Britain to allow businesses time to plan. Um, Seven years has been mentioned. So I think there'll be some time for adjustment. But adjustment is uh, basically trying to minimize the cost of disruption. It's not the same thing as, you know, sort of robustly growing your business. So given all the unknowns out there and the complexity that 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 all this brings, you know, what actions can procurement professionals or supply chain professionals take today to start mitigating the impact of this changing environment and and the impact that it might have on the goods and the services that they buy? Plan for supply chain and market access disruption. Yeah. So follow closely the policies as they appear and look ahead to how you would reorganize your supply chain and the location of where you deliver your services, depending on um, the industry that you're in. Mm -hmm. So all I think um, can be done, given the amount of unknowns, is to plan scenarios and to anticipate increases in costs where they might appear and work out ways uh, to grow the business, taking into account potential disruptions, which... This is very difficult to do, but I wouldn't say it's unprecedented. I think there are times in which you get big structural shifts in policy. And as the detail emerges, there will be an impact on businesses. And all you can do is to look at your strategy in the years coming ahead and be alert to policy changes, whether Mm -hmm. it's TPP or NAFTA or the timeline for Brexit and plan scenarios accordingly. Um, And I think to quote uh, a former British PM, you hope for the best and plan for the worst. (laughs) Right. Just kind of have all your options out there. It's like optionality. Make sure you've got optionality. Yes. Yes. I think it's a good way of putting it. And certainly um, diversification. Right. Well, um, Linda, I know that we're um, coming up against time now. So I just want to thank you so much for joining me today on this um, Procurious Big Idea Summit podcast. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thanks for listening to this Even Bigger Ideas podcast, sponsored by State of Flux. If you have any questions for Linda, simply tweet at Procurious underscore using the hashtag Big Ideas 2017, or share your questions and comments in the Big Ideas Digital Delegates group.